diagnosed with breast cancer a few years ago. And four months later, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he passed away six weeks after that. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Um, today I am joined by the delightful Kim Sorrell, who is not only an entrepreneur of a non-profit organization, but also an author and a speaker and a mother of five kids. And was it 11 grandchildren? Did I hear you say? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Kim. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. It is a pleasure for me to be here, for sure. Wow. I've listened to several of your episodes. I love your show. You've got great energy and you give such great information and advice. And uh, oh, so I'm happy to be a part of it. <laughs> I must admit, um, we we're just having a quick chat before we came on the podcast. And I'd, I'd forgotten how I'd first got in contact with Kim. And then she re recounted her story to me. And I was like, oh, that's right. As soon as I read your story, I was like, I have to have you on the show because my whole world, I talk about love and what love is in business and in, in, in your personal life. And I just think that um, I know you've got a story to tell about your discovery of love, if you like. Yes, yes, I sure do. Why don't you share yeah. that with us? Why don't you share that with us and then share with us, you know, what you're most proud of in your professional and personal life so far? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, um, I was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer a few years ago. Mm. And four months later, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he passed away six weeks after that. And for a whole lot of reasons and no reason at the same time, it made me question love and the reality of love and what love really is. And so I decided that there's a lot of movies, there's a lot of TV shows, there's a lot of songs, you know, about love, but what is love really? You know, it seems to be a mystery. So I decided I would dedicate a full year to discover what love really is. Most of the year I was in Haiti. I took a 2000 year old poem they hear at a lot of weddings, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, et cetera. And I decided I would take one word a month and figure out what is love that is patient? What is love that is kind? And, and the things that I found out were mind blowing and life changing. And I am now on this mission to share what I know with the world. That's fantastic. Um, so we'd like to share with us a little bit about what, you know, what did you learn? I mean, having a whole year off, that sounds um, divine, but it's also, of course, in a time of grief for you, I assume. So it would have been a mixture of feelings. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, isn't life always a mixture of feelings? <laughs> I think no matter where we are in life, it's it's always going to be jumbled up and, and whatever. But like, uh, for instance, right out of the gate, uh, Patience, love is patient. So what I found out, there's 14 is's and isn'ts of love in that poem. Wow. And so it took me a little longer than a year <laughs> with one a month, but I, I got it done. And each one has something very special and very particular about it. And at the same time, there's this overlying arc of, of love in general. And so both are just incredible things to know and then and then live because you know love love is not just a word it's not an emotion it's something you are it's it's something that you become it's something that you strive to be to be loved to other people and so it's living and breathing and walking and talking and giving and and so how do you do that how do you run your life that way how do you do that and so right out of the gate love is patient so, you know what patience is. I know what patience is. I'm not so good at it, but I understand it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Something I've, I've always been afraid to pray for because they say that you'll get what you pray for. And I wasn't sure I, that would be so easy. But uh, yes, we, you know, you're stuck in traffic and you're not honking your horn or you're mad because somebody's not ready when you're ready, you know, whatever. And so showing the kindness in that is being patient. What I figured out though, is love that is patient is entirely different than that. I believe you're supposed to love everybody. We should all just love everybody. The world would be a different place. And if you love everybody, then you recognize that this moment right here, right now is the most important moment of your life. What's in the past is in the past and what's in the future is yet to come. But it's so easy. It was so easy for me. I don't know about anybody else. But it was so easy for me to think that I was this grand multitasker 
And I could be in a conversation while I'm thinking about a meeting I have later that day and what I have to pick up at the grocery store on the way home and, and, and my rebuttal and my answer to the question all at the same time or the, my input to the conversation. And I discovered that's not true. It's not true. I'm not that multitask. And love that his patient would say, be in the moment and really listen to the person that you're with. To show love to the person you're with blocks out everything else because everything can wait. Right now, this is where you are. And so, and when you really listen, it changes things because you hear what people actually have to say, not what you're assuming they're going to say. And it's amazing how, how it really changes what you hear and what you understand. I can imagine there'll be a few people listening to this who will struggle um, in the same way that you did in terms of thinking, you know, um, I, I know I'm the same. I thought, I thought I was a great multitasker and I realized actually none of us can actually multitask, can we? I don't think it's actually physically possible. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. And I, I have to admit that it's taken me a lot of practice yeah. to be in the moment, to remind myself to be in the moment and with the person I'm with and show that kind of love. So I hear what you're saying. So, I mean, I struggle with this as well. How do you kind of bring yourself back to that presence? So I remember going to yoga classes and at the end, they sort of say, you know, lie down. They sort of say, imagine this. And I'd always find myself wandering off to what's for dinner tonight? What do I need to do tomorrow? How do I? Um, so how do you, you calm that sort of that noise, that clutter in your mind and actually focus on the person that you're with? Well, I think first it starts with the decision that this is the way you want to live. That, that you want to live a life of love and, and love that is patient is part of it. And so if you want to do it, anything that you want to do, you're willing to put some time in or you should be willing to put some time in. And so for me at the beginning, my head was everywhere and I'd try to reel it back in and then my thoughts would wander and I'd reel it back in. And then I just got to the point where I was like, this is silly. All I really need to do is focus. Just look, look the person I'm with in the eye and be fully present and, and block out everything. And it, it's certainly possible. You, you can do it. Anybody can do it, but you got to want to. It's a choice. And, yeah. you know, and work on it. Excellent. Okay, so that's number one of 14. <laughs> what about the others? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. There are so, so many great things that I learned. Uh, and... Um, like I, I'll tell you a quick story mm -hmm. about uh, one that I dreaded and it was uh, love does not keep a record of wrongs because I thought, well, you don't forget the things that happen to you. You know, you might forgive, but you really don't forget. I mean, they're still in your memory. Right. Yeah. And so what is love doesn't keep a record of wrongs? How does that possibly work? Well, I had this man call me from another state, a pastor, and he asked if I would go with him to Haiti because I was working on this water project down there and they wanted to see if they wanted to be a part of it. So I met these eight gentlemen from the US down in Haiti. And then I took two of my friends, uh, my Haitian friends who translate for us and, and work on the water project, I took them with us. We went out and we stayed at this little town in the countryside and we got to where we were gonna stay. And we drove in and there was, a small building with two small rooms. And each room had four twin size beds. So eight men from America, two men from Haiti, and me. And you. So <laughs> that, that, but I'm thinking we'll work it out. You know, there's more room in the room. We brought a couple of cots. We'll squeeze everybody in. You know, it'll be fine. Well, the head guy of the Americans said, Kim, Kim, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure, you know, whatever. And he said, did you see the rooms? And I'm thinking, buddy, there is nothing else to see. Of course I saw the rooms. I mean, here we are, that's, that's all there is. And, he, and then I thought, oh, he's gonna think I want my own room. So I'm gonna say to him, well, it's okay, I'll sleep outside. And he'll say, no, if anybody should sleep inside, it should be you. And then I'll say, well, I don't care if there's other people in my room. And he'll say, good, because we only have so much space. So I said, well, it's okay. I'll sleep outside. And he said, good, good, good. Because we have men that are with us that would be very uncomfortable with a woman in their room. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, I set myself up for this. I said that I would do it. So I 
looked around and there was the piece of plywood kind of being held up by some sticks. And I thought, well, if I sleep under that, at least if it rains, I'm protected from the rain. So the first night I went to bed and my air mattress held air for about an hour. Oh, no. And it was so loud, the dogs and horns honking and barking. And it was just so loud. And finally it settled down and finally I was going to get some sleep. And then the voodoo drum started in the distance and then that kept me up for a while. And then finally I could get some sleep like 5 a.m. And my biggest fear was that something, some critter, some animal, something, a snake or a tarantula or a chupacabra or whatever's lurking in the bushes in Haiti would attack me in the middle of the night. And I don't think there's really attack snakes, but I worried about them because there might be, who knows? And so the first night came and went without incident and everything was just fine. Second night, went to bed, air mattress, lost air, the dogs, the horns, the voodoo drums. Finally, I'm sleeping. And I woke up because there was something on my leg. Oh no. And I thought, oh my word, what could that possibly be? I was so afraid. And I was sleeping on my back thinking that's the easiest way to jump up and run if I have to. And so I'm on my back and I slowly lifted my head, slowly opened my eyes. And it was a chicken. A chicken. It was a dang chicken. (laughs) And I didn't know whether to be mad because this chicken is on my leg or happy that it's a chicken and not something worse. So I shoot it away, got a little bit of sleep. So night three came and went, no incident, everything's fine. Then came night four. And again, the dogs, the horns, uh, no air in the air mattress, et cetera. And again, I woke up because there was something on my leg. And again, I was scared to death to see what could possibly be on me. And I slowly lifted my head and opened my eyes. And again, it was the dang chicken. (laughs) That chicken was back on my leg and I shoot it away. And, and again, I didn't know whether to be mad or happy, you know, whatever, but I got some more sleep. But that night we had chicken for dinner. So I knew I'd have a pretty peaceful night on night five. So nothing <laughs> happened on night five. But at first I was bitter. I was angry, right? Like, what, what's this guy doing? You know, how come nobody's saying, Kim, maybe you should sleep inside. You know, we've got room for you. I mean, at first I was angry and disappointed in these people and and then I thought I'm working on love doesn't keep record of wrongs and then I finally realized what it means so we don't forget the things that happen to us we don't forget but the narrative changes so instead of oh my gosh these men did this to me and oh my word you know I had five sleepless nights back and whatever and and just being bitter uh, instead it's just something I lived through And it's a funny story. And I can literally sleep anywhere in the world now and be perfectly comfortable. So the narrative changes, the tone of the story changes. And instead of being the victim and and harboring it, something that they probably don't even remember happening. (laughs) Well, to to be fair, you actually said to them you would sleep outside. So (laughs) exactly. (laughs) So, yeah, so it's kind of not on them. Yeah. So yes, so instead of being bitter, and you know, bitterness eats us alive anyway, and, and it, it does us no good. And when we're bitter, the other person, the person we're bitter toward, usually has no idea that you're mad at them, no yes. idea. So why bother? So yeah. just love people and, and let it go, just let it go. Oh, I love it. And that's such a fantastic story. I'm so pleased it was just a chicken. <laughs> I mean, my <laughs> visions of tarantulas and things, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, I mean, that sounds like a, a, an amazing trip. Um, what else did you discover on that trip? Oh, my, uh, so much. You know, the about love in general, you know, the like what love truly is, because I, I think we get it wrong. We do. We get it wrong a lot. We think it it's all about romance and roses and and or we think it's, you know, our kids should just adore us, you know, be like 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 when you have grandkids, it's wonderful. It's like having a dog. Because yeah. you walk in the door and they are there and they're so happy to see you and you can do no wrong. And mm-hmm. but eventually they feed themselves and, and they shower themselves and, and put on their own clothes. So even better than a dog, <laughs> but they love you with this unconditional love. But so we have all these ideas about what love is. 
but love done the right way, really, when you understand it, when you break it down and take love for what it truly is, it is the greatest freedom because there is no judgment. There's no room for condemnation. There's no room for any negative. All you have to do is love. You don't have to fix anybody. You, you know, the truth is we're only in control of ourselves. We don't control other people. And so we spend a lot of time, I'm speaking for myself, unfortunately, in the past, spend time trying to fix people, trying to offer unsolicited advice. And I think I know the better way, right? Yeah. And, and nothing is going to change with that person. You know, we, uh, we control ourselves, our emotions, our actions. That's what we get to control. And so all we have to do is love people. That's all we have to do. So when you do that, it frees you to just love and not judge and not try to fix and not condemn and not put people in categories, but realize that people have names and we're all individuals and we're all unique and don't make assumptions about anybody and and anywhere for anything. Just love people, you know, open your ears, open your eyes, open your heart to who people really are, individuals really are. And, and that, I think, yeah. sorry, I was going to say, I think, I think as humans, you know, we do tend to judge quite quickly. And then also, we, uh, you, I always say to people, you've got to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You don't know what's going on for them right there, right now. You don't know what else there is that you can't even see. So you need to just be, yeah, I suppose, yeah, loving of them um, and just accepting of the way that they are. I know I'm actually, I'm third time married and um, learned a lot in my first two marriages. Now, super, super happily married in my third marriage. But because I've actually realized I can't, you can't marry somebody because you love them for this reason and then want to change everything about them to fit what you want from them, right? <laughs> Right. which I tried yeah. to do a couple of times it didn't work so well yeah, I've heard it doesn't work <laughs> no and so yeah it's been a real sort of revelation just kind of go actually you know um there, we are humans we're all a little bit different but this time around it's eyes wide open not trying to change anything just being you know completely loving of the person I'm with and it makes such a huge difference it does it does it makes such a huge difference and I think too you know when you get married a lot of times people will say well you know it's 50 50 or every, both of you have to give 100%, you know, or 110, not that that exists, but people will use that, you know, whatever. And they try to quantify love. They try to put a number on love. And the reality is love is on you only. No matter what somebody else does, your, your amount of love, your love, your living love is up to you. That's what you're responsible for. So no matter what your spouse does, no matter what your coworker does, no matter what your boss does, you still love them. You give the same amount of love, no matter what, Mm. without expecting anything in return. That's a beautiful thing about love is you have zero expectations. So you're never disappointed. (laughs) You're not wondering, well, shoot, I brought them a casserole. Where's mine? Right. And so you're not thinking of things like that, or I did this for them at work and, you know, now shoot, they went out to lunch with them and didn't even invite me or, you know, things like that. But you love because you love, not because you're looking for something in return. So if you love expecting love back from your spouse, from your husband, from whoever, then you're loving to get something in return. And that's not love. It has no expectations of getting anything in return. Just love, just, just love. Yeah. I, I love it. <laughs> That's a bit corny, but I love it. <laughs> so you've written a couple of books, haven't you? Would like to tell me a little bit about, so I can see one in the background there, Love Is. And what was the second one? Yes, uh, the other one is, it's called Cry Until You Laugh. Oh, cry, yes. Yes. And I, I started writing right after I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer because I went to a bookstore and everything was either very depressing or very medical. And I wanted to know, well, what is it like to go through breast cancer? Are there choices I need to make? Are there, you know, doctors that I need to see that I don't know about? What, what does it feel like? What am I going to feel like? What, what is it going to be? And so I started writing uh, as a way to update family and friends. Hey, I'm going to the doctor tomorrow, you know, instead of calling everybody. And it turned into much more than an update. And so I wrote what I was going through. And then I was still writing when my husband was diagnosed and I was still writing when he passed away. 
And I continued writing for a little over a year. And uh, that is what cry until you laugh is because I really believe that's what you need to do. I mean, we, we need to cry, but we need to laugh again as yeah. well. And yeah. There's no disrespect in that. Right. Mm. And so, then my second, yeah. Sorry, so, gonna, uh, so, so, so some people, you know, um, <laughs> I always get told by my friends, you're, you're so strong, you know, you always get through this. And I think, yeah, you just see that, you see the, the persona that I put on, whereas actually, in fact, when I'm at home, I had a big old cry last night about dad passing away and I was getting really emotional about it. And, and then eventually, yeah, we can turn ourselves around and we can laugh about it. But a lot of people don't want to show that because they feel it's a sign of weakness. So how, what would you say to people about, about crying? Yeah, cry. <laughs> oh my word we have to cry and, yeah. and everybody has permission to cry like of uh, we have bad days we lose people I mean my word if you don't cry when you lose somebody you love when are you gonna cry yeah. I mean you, that loss is heavy and hard it's so difficult and, and you can be in a fog for a while like you don't necessarily just the next day go, oh, well, you know, funeral's over, so now I'm okay. <laughs> no, I mean, your, your whole life has changed. Yeah. And so uh, and you're, the sadness is there and the sadness remains. But I, I think what can happen is people can, can get stuck in the sadness, get stuck in the, in the morning yeah. and feel like they're disrespectful if they have fun again, yeah. or if they, you know, laugh with people or, or, or whatever and not just focus on that person that they lost and just focus on their memory of them and whatever. It's okay to laugh again. It's okay to live. All of that stuff is okay. And it's okay to cry. It's okay to cry, cry, cry. It's healing. Crying is healing. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah, I agree. And it's, yeah. And, and you have so many mixed emotions that when somebody passes away, you do. I mean, I must, I've, I've gone through, um, you know, real deep sadness. And then I felt, then I have gone off. I had some fun with my friends and I felt guilty for going off and having fun with my friends. And then I've gone off and done some shopping and then gone, what am I doing up shopping? I should be, you know, sort of mourning. And so there was just all these waves of emotions that come over, but yeah. Okay. So that's mm-hmm. cry until you laugh. And then the love is book, which what's that one about? Obviously yeah, love. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, you know, went on this journey to yeah. learn the true meaning of love. And so each chapter I start out with what I think the word of the month is, what I think patience is. And then I tell the story of what happens in Haiti. Most of the time I was in Haiti uh, yeah. when I was writing this and living this journey. And I tell the story of what happened that brought me to the realization of what that word really is, what yeah. love, because when you put love is or love is not in front of anything, it changes the meaning of the word. It's no longer what's in the dictionary. Yeah. And yeah. so figuring out that meaning was seemed like it'd be so simple. And maybe for somebody else, it might have been easier and faster. But uh, it takes it took a while. It took some time. I mean, I really had to work on it. And so the book, my book is called Love Is. And uh, it's available everywhere. And and. That's, so, that's so it's got those 14 words in there about lovers and lovers not and, and then how you actually found out what the real meaning of that is mm-hmm. oh, exactly sounds, sounds great now I'm going to ask you a little bit about your business because you said right at the beginning you're, you're an entrepreneur of a not-for-profit what is it that you what is your not-for-profit what is it that you do well uh those are two two things that I do I am an entrepreneur and I run a non-profit okay so as a non-profit the organization that I run is a partnering organization we work with people in their own country who have a passion, a mission, a vision to help people in their own country, and they just need somebody to walk alongside. And they understand the culture, they understand the language, and they understand the real need. It can be so easy to think we know, you know, we know their answers, you know, we we know what they need, and sometimes we're wrong. But people need maybe they need a business plan. They, they need a, a way always to lead towards self-sustainability. So they're not always chasing dollars, but it's awfully hard to have a school with no pencils and no desks, right? Yeah. And so that might be their need if that's what their passion is to, to start a school. In so many countries, there's not near enough schools for all the kids that are there. Mm-hmm. So schools, medical clinics uh, are mostly what we're, we're involved in and water projects. Um, so yeah, oh, it's wow, partnered awesome. with a lot of people. It's fun. Yeah, it sounds like it. And all, all with a, a real purpose or passion for making a difference, right? 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. As we all should. I mean, that. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree. Okay. So in terms of bringing love into business, because this is one of the, I've got I, in my office um, upstairs, I've got this sort of great big sign. I actually painted myself. I went on a painting weekend. I'd never painted in my life and I painted a big pair of angel wings. And then you were asked to put a word on it. And the word that just came to you was love. So it's got this big love with the big angel wings there. And I, I proudly put it in my office because it's my painting. And I kind of quite, you know, I was quite proud of it, but also it's love is everything, right? The, without love, there is nothing. But in terms of bringing into business, people kind of go, oh, you know, we'd kind of have that sort of fluffy stuff in business. What does that really mean? So how would you describe love in business? Well, you know, love brings authenticity. Mm. And if you think about yourself and who you want to do business with, you want to do business with people who you really believe care about you, yeah. who you believe have your best interest in mind. And we're yeah, that comes down to it's people that love you. Yeah. And because when you love somebody, you're going to have their best interest in mind. You're going to help them in whatever way they need help. You're going to want to partner with people and, and care about them. Mm -hmm. And when you feel cared about, it changes a lot of things. So when I come down to, oh gosh, should I, should I buy from this company or should I buy from this company? Well, love is always going to win. <laughs> love will always win. So, and it's the same with coworkers. You know, there are times that everybody's probably worked with somebody that just drove them batty, right? Yes. I mean, and I think everybody's had that experience. But if you come from a whole different angle and you come from an angle of love and realize, you know, you're not going home with that person. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know their upbringing, their whole story of their upbringing and what they've been through. And Every day that we live leads us to where we are today and who we are today, right? Yeah. And so we don't we don't know what that other person's been through. And there can be a whole lot of reasons that somebody's driving you crazy. Yeah. But if you stop and you start loving the person and you make the effort and you really think about it and you you really do it, not just say it, but you really do it, the relationship will change. Yeah. The relationship will change. It's interesting because I did that with my husband early in our marriage. He was driving me crazy and I had little kids and I felt like I was doing all the work. He'd go to work, he'd come home and he'd lay on the couch, you know, and I'm doing all the laundry, I'm making dinner, I'm doing it all. And I thought, well, I could do all this without him. What do I need him for? You know, he's not doing anything, but I made the decision that I was going to do everything I could to make him happy. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to do. No matter what, no matter if he ever responded, never responded, I didn't put a time limit on it. You know, I'm doing it for three months. If he doesn't change, I'm out of here. Yeah. I just decided I want a happy marriage. Yeah. And so I want a happy husband. So I'm going to do everything I can. So I'd go to the grocery store and pick up his favorite candy or dessert, you know, and yeah. I'd make his favorite meals. I'd write a little note in the morning, you know, just anything I could do to make him happy, anything I could do to make him happy. And he did change. Yeah. He did change. But the reality is I changed. Mm -hmm. I changed because my heart changed. Yes. When I dove into love and I put on a blanket of love and wore it and lived it, yeah. I changed. That changed me. It changed my attitude toward my husband. Mm -hmm. So I think he changed, but it's almost like I think he changed sort of like um, once a month. He got really cranky. And I, I, I knew it must be him getting cranky once a month, not me getting <laughs> cranky once a month. So it, it's kind of like that. Yeah. But, but our marriage changed and, and it was wonderful. It was yeah. great. And so it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. There's a, there's a book called The Surrendered Wife. And when I heard about this book, I, I just did not want to read it because it's much like, well, why should the wife have to surrender? That's just absolutely ridiculous. You know? <laughs> and I, but I got the book and I started reading it and it was exactly this, this principle. It's actually not about surrendering per se. It's about just accepting, you know, coming from a place of love and doing everything in your power to make the person you love um, you know, happy as well. And it does, it changes everything about the way that you do things. Therefore, yeah, you're, you're, it's actually you that changes not the not necessarily the person that you're with <laughs> yeah right. so the same principle applies in business though too doesn't it um so you're saying if you've got a co-worker who's driving up the wall it's just about um having that sort of empathy and just loving them for who they are 
um, doing whatever you can, I suppose doing whatever you can control, because the only thing you can tr- control is yourself. Uh, it's so true. It's so yeah. true. And there are things in life, of course, that you can't control, you know, your yeah. father getting cancer. You know, if you could yeah. change that, you would not hurt me. My husband getting cancer, I'd change it in a heartbeat. But we have no control over that, but we do control ourselves and ourselves. we do control how we are how, to other people. And we, how we, we feel. That how we feel. We control our level of happiness, our level of joy. We shouldn't let other people control whether or not we're having a good day. Yep. Right. I mean, yeah. we, it should be on us because that's what we have control over and try not to let the things that maybe want to interfere with your happiness come in, like yeah. ignore, ignore those things. Who needs them? <laughs> but, but you don't have to be best friends with everybody. You know, that's not what love is. Mm. You don't have to invite everybody over for a potluck or, you know, invite everybody to your picnic. You can't feed the world. I mean, you, you, you can't. I mean, I don't know who can. But you don't have to be best friends with everybody. Mm. But if you love them, then you let them be who they are. Then you let them live the life that they feel led to live. You let them be who they are, even if that's not who you are and that's not who you want to be. Love them and, and let them be who they are. Let them be their true authentic self and then admire it in a way say, because they're unique, you know, the people that drive us crazy, they drive us crazy because they're different from us. Yes. Well, it's, it's kind of nice. We're not all the same. It'd be kind of a boring world. Yeah. So figure out there's things to, to really enjoy about them. And when you love them, when you put that on, when you decide this is what you're going to do and you're going to live love, man, your relationship with that person will change. It, it has to, it has to. I agree. Yeah, that's fantastic. Hey, look, we could talk about this subject all day long, no doubt, because it's something I'm very passionate about as well. But in terms of, you know, we like to give the listeners a, a few tips and tools they can take away, they can put into their life straight away. What are your kind of three top tips or tools that you would share with the listeners? I, I would say, number one, be authentic, be real. Don't, don't be phony to people. People know whether or not you really care about them, whether or not you're really interested in their lives, you know, be, be authentic. It it changes business. It changes the way you deal in life. If you just let yourself not have this different face you put on at the office, right. But just be who you are, live, live who you are and be, be authentic Authentic. to everybody all the time Mm -hmm. and be forgiving, be forgiving. My word, if people didn't forgive me for the things I did, I, I don't know where I'd be. I probably would have no <laughs> friends and my family would disown me. Yeah. So yeah. be forgiving, you know, let, let it go and, and change the narrative, you know, change the narrative on the story. Don't harbor it. Don't, yeah. don't be bitter. You know, it doesn't do you any good at all. So let it go. Let it go. I think and I would a... say one, one of the best Sorry. things people can do yeah. to, as a yeah. third thing one of the best things people can do is think about somebody that you're not in relationship with now that you used to be. Oh, yeah. Maybe you're, you're not talking to your brother right now, or maybe there's somebody you used to work with and you used to be really close. You used to know them well, and then you haven't talked to them in so long. And, and think of somebody like that, that, that maybe there needs to be a healing in the relationship or a rekindling of the relationship, or at least acknowledging that the relationship was there yeah. and reach out, reach out with phone call, a note, write a handwritten note goes a long way, but reach out and, and, um, you know, be the one that, that loves just, just love them. And that's my advice. That is fantastic. Thank you so, so much. So in terms of, I'd love um, to share the books. So the books obviously is Cry Until You Laugh and Love Is, the two books you've written. Where can people get hold of those, Kim? Uh, pretty much any online bookseller. Yep. Um, in the US, they're in some brick and mortar stores as well, Barnes and Noble, places like that. And uh, But any, any online bookseller or even your local bookstore can order it in for you or whatever so it's it's readily available they're readily available yeah and or on my website which is kim which is obnoxious i'm literally the only kim <laughs> Sorrell spelled my way in the entire world because there's way too many letters two r's two e's two l's 
So nobody remembers Kim Sorrell, <sighs> that kind of, but uh, love is that info also takes you to my yeah. website. Love is that info. info. Yep. A little bit easier. Yeah. No, and I'll, I'll put those links in the bottom of the um the podcast thing as well and if they wanted to get in, cold, in contact with you personally is that also the best way to get hold of you yes and again I'm the only Kim Sorrell spelled my way so I'm very easy to find if you yeah. type in google you know uh love is Kim you know whatever I'll pop up wow and um I so I'm easy to find I'm on the social networks and wherever through my website. And I love to hear from people. I love yeah. to hear from people. There are people that are using my book at their office yeah. and everybody has a copy. And once a month they're having a meeting and they're talking about a word a month and it's changing the mm-hmm. dynamics. It's changing the culture of the company. And so that's, I love hearing stories like that. And, and families are doing the same. And it's just, I love hearing those stories and knowing that it's having an effect on people's lives. I can see that you're really passionate about it. I can see, feel the love, even though we're not in the same room together. I can feel the love. It's great. Hey, look, um, thank you so, so much for your time this morning. It's actually afternoon for you, isn't it? <laughs> evening. Yes. Evening, is it? Okay, even evening. Well, thank you very much for your time this evening, morning over here in New Zealand. <laughs> um, absolutely. Yeah, so much fun to talk to you. Really enjoyed the tips and things that you shared and the stories about the chickens. All will stay with me forever. So thank you for that. Um, and I suppose on a parting note, yeah, I mean, love really is all that there is in this world. And I think that if we can just accept everybody for who they are, love them for who they are, the world's going to be a whole lot better place. And you've reminded me of that. So thank you. 